award-winning futurist researcher and keynote speaker Nicholas Badminton joining us on Canada Now for his weekly visit. Nick, this week we look at short-termism versus long-termism. Yeah, it's the idea that uh, we, I think we need to start to look out 50, 100, 200, 500, even 1,000 years into the future and start making plans today to create resiliency and you know, and we can see see that need with climate change, the way that biodiversity is happening in the world, At ocean acidification, oh, a whole bunch of different things, right? We have to start making uh, plans today and we have to start taking action versus the, like short-termism. And short-termism is the idea that a politician stands on stage and says, vote for me and I'll do these, these 10 things for you. And over the next three to four years, I'm going to make this happen. And um, within a couple of years, all of the goalposts have changed and whatever. And it's like that sort of inward facing selfish egotism that sort of drives how the world is working. So, I mean, I'm writing a book called Facing Our Futures right now. And that book is actually looking at the idea of looking at potential like far futures that could be terrible as well as good and we can start to do better and more resilient planning today but the idea of long-termism is really really important because there's lots of warning signals about how the world is is going to change but there's very few people that are either thinking long term and if some people are saying they're thinking long term that they kind of aren't they're kind of doing it for their own short-term um, gains and thinking that oh here's here's a solution in a box whether that's technology or whatever that can solve that and create a better world forever you know mm. but would uh, the pandemic have changed that like because th the demand for more of a look at at long-termism has to come from us it, it it's it we're not going to wait on the on the politicians uh, to step up and and do that so would the pandemic have changed things where Nobody could have foreseen necessarily that this would have happened for the past almost couple of years. So in seeing that and living through that, well, we don't want that to happen again uh, for, right. for generations uh, down down the line. So might our mindset shift to a point where we demand that of uh, of our government leaders? Well, we, we'd certainly hope so, right? But when SARS kicked in, I think it was around about 2003, and MERS kicked in, and all these conversations were had time and time again, and even Ebola, you know, and it, it, the, the, these, uh, well, something like Ebola is uh, much more difficult in terms of being able to catch it, but like, SARS and MERS are still like respiratory viruses, right? And that could have been actually as bad as, as what we found with COVID-19. Um We've known about these kinds of viruses for a very long time. And, you know, some people in the foresight world, like, I, like I, I'm in, you know, as, as futurists and working with governments, really putting together reports and saying, this is coming, we're going to do something about this, and we're going to have long-term plans beyond the pandemic now, are really important conversations. But, but there's a lot of rhetoric and there's a lot of pushback especially from political circles and we have to remember that whilst we can say it's down to us we still live within political infrastructure that that is is working on you know the three to four year cycles right and if we're, we're living in that and we're forced to live in that all of the infrastructure all of the healthcare, all of the education all of these different you know um, structures to to our lives that are hugely important for resiliency and the futures that are ahead of us are in the hands of people that only care about looking at the end of their nose rather than you know to the far future horizons about what's responsible right and that that's that's really concerning to me and we're sort of outsourcing ideas of the future to people like Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos that are looking to space and looking for other alternatives to living on Earth, which is which is a distraction away from uh, what we need to be looking at today. Mm. Well, you know, it, it, for those that would be only looking at the, the end of their nose, for many people, that would be short termism. But my nose is so big, it would be long termism. Nick, Jeff, Jeff. it would be long termism. <laughs> Uh, I, well, but, you know, jokes aside, I think what, what's interesting is that, you know, there's lots of warning signals. I, I think I, set, I, I shared a few articles with you and it was like, yeah. you know, droughts, fires and floods, how climate change will impact Europe. And that's an incredible article from Politico. Um, even on the BC government website, the, their map of, the, of, of 2100 and the, and the rising, potential rising sea levels yeah. and the extensive nature of floodplains in BC 
Yeah, these, these things are real, realistic. I mean, there's even an architecture firm, construction company out in uh, the Netherlands, in Holland, that, that's looking at 2200 and Amsterdam is gone. Amsterdam, it's completely right. gone when you're looking at a two meter, three meter, even a six meter rise in, in sea level. You know, there, there's nothing that can stop nature from, from, from taking back the, uh, the, the land there, right? Mm. So it, it's kind of interesting. There's so many warning signals that we're just not... Uh, paying attention and when people are paying attention say oh no this is this is an extreme point of view and how is this really going to ever happen and whatever and denial is is not a river in africa jeff we have to (laughs) you know take things seriously uh and it's funny you mentioned amsterdam because later on in the show we're going to be talking to our travel expert liz Beatty about uh, uh uh cannabis tourism and how yeah. uh, you know people would flock to Amsterdam for that, but they've changed some of the rules and regulations there, where people aren't going to go there uh, as much. Amsterdam doesn't want that as much. Well, if there's yeah. no Amsterdam, then cannabis tourism is going to have to rely on other parts of the world uh, for that. Are, are we are we not only facing the permanent collapse of civilization, maybe even extinction, uh, but are, are we heavily funding it? We, you know, if, if we're funding uh, the, the industrial complex that exists to get today, where all of our transportation and energy uh, solutions are based on uh, fossil fuels, then then we're actively funding it. And people um, in, in the fossil fuel industry that, that are lobbying gov- governments to, to fight back against, uh, you know, environmental rules, the Paris Agreement, whatever, are, are complicit. In, in putting us on a trajectory that's very, very uh, tough to sustain. I mean, the extinction of the human race. Okay, we gotta, we got to get rid of that language. we got to get rid of those extremes and be very realistic. Things are going to change. Things are going to get tougher. The world is going to get hotter. What is that going to mean? I, I sent you another article, uh, which was mm-hmm. in Scientific American, and there was a uh, the United Nations assessment of the nationally determined contributions and they sort of war- warn about what's happening over the next, you know, a, f- a few hundred years. And there, there's there's some researchers that put together ideas of like the Amazon Midwest and India in 2500. To me, this isn't very far away. Yeah. But like, let, let, let's see what they thought might happen. So the Amazon in 2500 shows a barren landscape and low water levels resulting from vegetation decline with sparse or degraded infrastructure and minimal human activity basically decimation of the amazon you know the lungs of the world you know what's that going to mean as a knock-on effect that, that's very concerning so let's look to the midwest u.s that they also looked at so this is from like north and south dakota out to ohio and everyone in between there right mm. michigan and, and otherwise so agricultural adaption to hot and humid subtropical climates in north america with imagined subtropical agroforestry based on oil palms and arid zone succulents. You know, the crops attended by AI drones will reduce human presence. You know, it, you know we go on vacation to the Car- Caribbean. Maybe we're going to go on vacation to Ohio and have the same kind of experience, <laughs> right? It's, it, it kind of sounds like romantic, but it's actually devastational if you think about it. Yeah. And then look to somewhere like India that's going to be one of the most powerful companies in the world, uh, countries in the world. It's going to have billions of people, multi-generational, and uh, it's going to get tough. It's going to get hot. Um, So they're going to have a a world in 2500 where there's a future of heat adaptive technologies included like robotic agriculture, green buildings, basically people not going outside, everyone staying inside. And if we've got the the caste system and and the, the, the wealth gaps and poverty and what we see today, you know, people are going to be dying. We're, we're talking about infant mortality rates going up. We're talking about, you know, older people like struggling. You know, the average age of people is going to start dropping in these kinds of places. So it's really, really tough. It really concerns me. And, um, you know, we feel helpless. So what do we do when we feel helpless? We try and look for those point solutions. It's like, oh, these people are promising us a better world. But really, who are the people that are sitting down and saying structurally, what do we need to do? Mm. And how do we create a strategy for the next few hundred years? And uh, that's what I want to work in. But well, there's a lot of people out there that are trying to fight against that. Because, again, how do you get funding for the next three to five hundred years? It's very difficult. How do you get funding for the next four? Well, you, you can get that from people that want to own our future, right, Jeff? Mm. So w- with technology, like have we invested too much time and hope into technology fixing all the world's problems, Nick? Like will the... 
the technology we create actually bring us closer to extinction rather than save us from it as originally intended? You know, the idea um, that we can, uh, there's something called the value neutrality uh, thesis. It states that technology is like a morally neutral object. It's just a tool and we can, we can, we can invest in that and it can fix our problems with enough time, money and blood and sweat and, and tears and the such like. But really, you know, technology and the people that, that, that own stock in those companies, the shareholders, the people that have invested in it, you know, the founders, they're, they're not morally neutral. Right. So so we, if we invest in a technology, we're investing in the people that run it and we're, we're investing in the decisions that they can make. I mean, the big the big furore recently are around sort of Facebook and the whistleblowers and what's actually happening with that. You know, everyone's everyone went to Facebook because it fixes the communication problems around the world. But the decisions around policy and algorithm and whatever have actually meant that it, it's created a, an, an echo chamber for the bad and the fake and, and the people that are trying to manipulate government, governmental control and democracy and whatever. Right? So we, 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 we need to have a moral technological you know, standard around the world in a way. Mm-hmm. And we also need to have a, a moral a societal standard in, in, in the world. And we need to have that bound by ethics and, and equity, e- equitable uh, sort of uh, involvement in that as well. We need to own our data. We need to be an active part of that. And we need to have some good coming out of the back end of this. And so what we've, what we've got is we've got hundreds of thousands, if not millions of tech companies around the world that are trying to get users. That language is, is kind of a bit sick if you think about that because <laughs> we're people and we're, we're, we've got families and whatever. And then those, they're, they're just trying to get acquired. They're trying to grow revenues. And, and as soon as they start focusing on that, and not on the good for humanity, they literally throw everything away and they don't care about our futures. And they literally are caring quarter by quarter how much money they're going to make. Mm. Getting back to the disaster that could be uh, by the year uh, 2500, um, if countries are to be saved, are they going to be the rich ones? Like, are the rich ones going to be saved first? The, the rich ones can survive longer than the poor ones, right? It's interesting. I did a, uh, mm-hmm. I did a, a, a project in the Cayman Islands and clearly a very wealthy place, right? Um, mm-hmm. Lots of offshore money and whatever. And uh, they were able to recover after hurricanes, like something like three times faster than other islands, just because they, the amount of money that they had ah, available to sure. be able to recover, to sure. bring in the materials, to bring in the people, uh, to, you know, and then create the resilient infrastructure. So wealthy co- countries, you would think, have got the, the capability to, to create resiliency. A poorer countries struggle, mm. right? So, so, yeah, absolutely. And, and that's what we need to look at globally. For me, the next uh, far, three to 500 years is, is going to be about population migration around the world. It's going to be about the growth of Africa and Asia. It's going to be about the changing power dynamics. And it's going to have to be a world that, that, that is defined by uh, the, a lack of ego and, and, and a total global collaboration effort around creating a better world for all in, in humanity. And I'll be honest, Jeff, and I've said this uh, live in other interviews and also on stage, and it, it gets people's heckles up. You know, once the old, the old men get out of the way of government and let more women and more alternative thinking people into governmental positions where they focus on our, our children, our societal structures, our education, our, our water, food, and energy sovereignty, then uh, it's going to be a better world for all. Mm. Well, uh, I'll ask you this on the way out. Uh, are futurists all over this uh, more focus on long-termism? Are futurists all over this? Are philosophers all over this? You know, there, there, there's there's a number of philosophers out there that are really starting to, to wave the flags. But really, there's not. And, and you know, f- futurists and foresight folks like like myself really are. We're starting to wave the flag and say we need to pay attention. Uh, that that serves us very well. The trouble is there's not enough people doing it. They are really, you know, they're, they're, they're in the, the, the corners of society. You know, oh, look, look at that mad person in the corner. You know, <laughs> the, 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 the end is nigh, sort of that apocalypse philosophers in a way right and i like looking at dark futures and i'm writing a whole book on that kind of stuff yeah but it's really the 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 end of the exercise is to 
understand and anticipate the risks, long-term risks, long-term tr- strategic goals, the partnerships that we need and the principles that we need um, to work collaboratively in this world to, so that you know, our children's children's children are actually thinking about resiliency. Indigenous, uh, you know, indigenous culture thinks about seven generations ahead. The actions that we undertake today will 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 ring through seven generations. Mm. Why can't we do that? You know, yeah. we need to stop and listen to to the smart thinking sort of indigenous populations that that have always had more of a sensible relationship between mother earth and human society that's right uh, very well said check out nicholas futurist researcher and keynote speaker nicholas badminton always a pleasure my friend uh, we'll talk to you again next week keep fighting for the future jeff uh, i'm trying i'm trying nick thank you for your help uh, on that 